what is death other than the lifting of one last veil? Here we are with Allah. There we are with Allah. What room is there for fear or even hope for that matter? There's only being with Allah, being with the beloved. Welcome to the Sufi Heart Podcast with Omid Safi, featuring teachings and stories from the wisdom of the Islamic tradition. Omid invites you to a meditation on the transformative power of love and recalling the necessity of healing our own hearts through healing the world. If you'd like to support Omid's podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Omid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-makhlukat wa sayyid al-mursaleen. What an incredible joy and an honor to get to share some thoughts and reflections, some beautiful teachings from this path of love, which is at the very heart of of the Islamic tradition. Uh, let's begin with one of the most well-known stories from the life of the Habib, the chosen one, God's own beloved. Uh, we are told that one day the prophet is sitting around with his friends, his companions. And all of a sudden there is a stranger who comes into their midst and uh, he comes right up to the prophet and sits knee to knee, thigh to thigh, uh, in a position of great familiarity. And uh, the companions are a bit puzzled. Who is this stranger? And how come he is sitting in such a familiar position with the prophet? And uh, he says, I have some questions for you. And the prophet says, yes. He says, what is Islam? And the companions are baffled. Um, who is this person? Where has he come from? And then he is quizzing the messenger of Allah, the prophet of Islam, on what is Islam. Uh, nevertheless, the prophet uh, proceeds to answer, and he states that, well, Islam is to have faith in oneness, in the unity, the unity of Allah. Uh, to uphold the prayers, uh, to fast in the holy month of Ramadan, uh, to take care of the poor through paying of the zakat, and as one is able to, to undertake the pilgrimage to Mecca. And the stranger says, you have answered correctly. The companions are astonished. Who is this person? He's coming and he's asking the prophet, what is Islam? And then he says, you've answered correctly, as if he's the one who is in a position of knowing. Then comes the second question. What is Iman? What is faith? And the prophet says, ah, well, faith is to have faith in God and the angels and the prophets and the scriptures and the day of judgment to come. You have answered quick." I have answered correctly again, says the stranger. And then comes the third and the final question. And what is Ihsan? Ihsan. This is that concept which sometimes gets translated as spiritual excellence. It's a rather dull translation. Some people say, what is virtue? But really, the root of the matter is from husn, which is goodness and beauty. It is where names like Hassan and Hussein and Husna and Muhsan come from. So Ihsan is really to make beauty real. It's the actualization, the realization of goodness and beauty. Ihsan is the name that is given to that entire dimension of spirituality and aesthetics in Islam, the spiritual life, the mystical life, 
This is the Ihsani dimension. And the Habib, the chosen one, alayhi salatu wasalam, says, well, uh, Ihsan is to adore God, to worship Allah as if you see him. And if you don't, to remember that Allah nevertheless sees you. To worship God as if you see Allah. And if you don't, to remember that Allah nevertheless sees you. A third time, the stranger wearing white head to toe says, you have answered correctly. And he gets up and he essentially poofs. <laughs> he walks out and no one can catch up with him. And then the Habib, the chosen one, alayhi salatu wasalam, says, that was Jibreel, the archangel Gabriel, who has come to teach you your faith. Hmm. This hadith is featured very prominently in the life of the Blessed One uh, and in the hadith collections. And the order of the questions itself is also important. Uh, we begin the religious life with Islam, with doing what is required of us to pray, to fast, to go on the pilgrimage. And then above that is the level of faith where these become realities in our heart. Uh, there's a passage in the Quran where a group of nomads come to the Prophet and they ask him to bear witness that they have faith. And the Prophet is made to answer to them, mm, not quite yet. You are doing the Islam part. You are submitting yourself to Allah. You are performing the rituals properly, but you haven't yet attained to faith. And above Islam and above Iman is the level of goodness, the level of beauty, the level at which loveliness permeates the whole of our being. We can all think of people who religiously might perform everything that is asked of them, but they don't have kindness, they don't have gentleness, they may not yet have attained to loveliness. And that quality of ihsan is really the subject of our whole discussion. This is that love dimension uh, which characterizes our whole faith. It's the goal. It's the aspiration. It's what we yearn for, what we long for. To adore God as if we see him. And if we don't, and there's many sages who have read that same saying to mean, but you do. <laughs> you think you don't, but you do to remember that God nevertheless sees us. Uh, Imam Ali, uh, may God bless him and ennoble his countenance, was asked at one point, do you see Allah? And his answer was, I would never worship a God whom I could not see. And people said, how can you see Allah? And he said, not with the eyes of the head, but rather with the eyes of the heart. Uh, this is one of the goals, to have an activation, an illumination of our inner faculties. You have eyes other than the eyes of the head, ears other than the ears of the head. We're looking for spiritual faculties with which we are intended to be related to Allah. And this love-based dimension of Islam is ultimately designed to take us to that divine presence directly, immediately. Uh, the wonderful classical Sufi Fariduddin Attar tells a beautiful story of a famous Sufi, Zulnun Mesri. Uh, 
Zulnoon, the Egyptian, one of the classic friends of Allah from the early period. And he has a visionary experience in which the whole of humanity is gathered up. Um, this is a recreation of that primordial covenant with Allah. And a series of questions is posed to this awesome gathering, uh, not really a quiz per se, but a series of gifts of offerings from God. Uh, who wishes to be spared all pain, to never again suffer, and to be spared the torment of hellfire? What is the catch? There is no catch. It's a free gift. So people look around and about 90% of the people think to themselves, wow, to be spared pain. No more suffering. No more heartache. No more agonizing over losing loved ones. No more your knee and your back hurting. No more the fear of damnation in hellfire. Sounds pretty good. So 90% of them put up their hands and they wait and they wait and the voice of Allah comes, it is granted unto you. You may leave. So they leave. The gathering shrinks. The voice of Allah comes a second time. Who here wishes to attain to my loftiest garden? A paradise so sublime and so luminous that no eye has ever seen it and no words have ever described it. Wow. To attain to that level of paradise, even beyond any descriptions that we have ever heard, that sounds sublime. So of those who are left, 90% of them raise their hand. They wait to see what's coming. It is granted unto you. You may leave. So they leave. And Zulnun says that by that time, there was just a very small handful of people left, the ones who had turned down the opportunity to be spared pain and suffering, and the ones who had turned down uh, the offer, the promise of the most sublime paradise. And this handful of people now experience the voice of Allah coming to them majestically in a thunderous voice. I gave you deliverance from all pain, salvation from hellfire. You chose it not. I gave you my supreme pleasure, the highest realm of paradise. You chose it not. What have you come here for? And these few people left, lower their heads in humility, and they say simply, we did not come to be spared hellfire, and we did not even come for paradise. We came for you. Now the voice of Allah comes to them in a gentle way and he says, in that case, I, I am yours. These are the friends with whom we are concerned. The ones who love the gardener more than they love the garden the ones who are in it for the sake of Allah, even beyond the promise of paradise and salvation. And this is a proud tradition in our beautiful faith. These are the ones who, whose sight is not distracted by the extraordinary fruits of their spiritual experience. So we hear the prayer of friends like Rabia, 
Hazrat Arabia, probably the most famous female mystic that we have had in our tradition. And she says the following. This is her famous prayer. O oh Lord, if I worship you for fear of hell, burn me in that hell. If I worship you hoping for paradise, make it forbidden for me. But if I worship you only for your own sake, do not, do not withhold from me your everlasting beauty. Do not withhold from me your everlasting beauty. Right? The primary way in which Rabia experiences Allah is through beauty. Uh, we get some extraordinary accounts in the lives of these saints of the way in which they come to experience Allah. Of course, uh, we know that in the Quran Sharif, we are told that Allah is closer to you than the beating of the heart and the jugular vein. That Allah comes between a person and their heart. Allah mingles inside your consciousness. Uh, there's a charming story that uh, Rabia is walking by one day. We're told that she's walking past a mosque, a church, a temple. It's not very clear. And there's a preacher sitting on the pulpit. And the preacher is um, stating that account, which is so well known from many scriptures. You hear versions of this in the Gospels. Um, Ask, and it shall be granted unto you. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And uh, Rabia sticks her head in and says, What did you say? And this preacher was perhaps just a little annoyed that this woman has interrupted his eloquent sermon, says, Woman, I said, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And Rabia says, fool, the door is never closed. The door is never closed. A few centuries later, Molana Rumi, who has grown up with these stories. Uh, he knows Rabia's teachings. He pays the ultimate compliment to Rabia by taking her insight and going even further with it. So he has a beautiful quatrain in which he says, my friend, you have spent your entire existence knocking and knocking and knocking at God's door. My beloved, you are knocking from the inside. You are already within the divine presence. And you keep knocking at this door to open when you're already home. There is nothing outside of Allah. How could there be? How could anything have an independent existence outside of Allah? If anything existed outside of Allah, he would be another God. So that's why we get South Asian Sufis from the Chishti tradition that say things like, God is closer to you than the ocean is to the fish. God is closer to you than the ocean is to the fish. There's a beautiful passage that touches on this theme 
in the Quran, Wallahu min wara'ihim muhit. And God embraces you, God wraps around you from the behind. And that word muhit also has a meaning of ocean. So God oceanically wraps around you. And that's an important insight, that on this path, we can start to let go of the notion of directionality, of this myth that somehow God is somehow to be found out there or perhaps in some putative future. Instead, God is to be found here and now, always and forever. That the divine is not simply to be experienced in the afterlife, in the heavenly realm in the celestial realm. Here and now, where you are, where we are, we can come to experience Allah. That's one reason why the Sufis, the mystics, the lovers of Allah, who very rarely use the term Sufi, But one of the terms that they do use for themselves is Ibn al-Waqt, bint al-Waqt, a child of the moment, a child of the eternal now. That's a beautiful teaching for us to reflect on. A child of the eternal now. We live in this very eternal moment. We have risen above that mistake of constantly dwelling on what happened to us in the past, perhaps being worried about some pain or some suffering that happened to us back then and there. But nor are we simply waiting for some future to come, some otherworldly reward to come. Here and now, we are. Here and now, in this eternal moment, we come to experience God. And the reason that we have that capacity is because we have been created in the image of Allah. We have been created with the capacity to know Allah. According to the Quran, when afakhtu fihi men ruhi, God states that he breathed something of his spirit into us. And you can only know Allah by something that is of Allah and from Allah. And that something is the spirit. And the seat of the spirit, the throne of the spirit, is the heart. Um, The heart in Western imagination sometimes is taken as an organ of perhaps a flesh that pumps blood, or in some cases it's taken simply as um, the seat of your sentimentality. But not so in our tradition. In our tradition, emotions and sentimentality are embraced and honored. They They too have a role. But the heart is the seat of the spirit. And so the Habib, the chosen one, alayhi salatu wasalam, says, Indeed, in the body there is a piece of flesh, heart. If it is sound, the whole being is sound. And if it corrupts, then the whole being is corrupt. 
And that is the heart, he says. This ability to be present here and now, to give our full and complete attention. Now think about the fact that in our culture, we use a lot of words for multitasking, the ability to listen to a talk while tending to other things. We hardly have a word or a concept for single tasking, undivided, whole attention. And we know this, of course, from the example of the chosen one, alayhi salatu wassalam, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, whom we know when he would speak with someone, whenever he would speak with someone, he didn't make them feel like they were the most important person in the world. They actually describe it as being made to feel like they were the only person in the world. We know that when he would be speaking with someone, he wouldn't just turn his head. He would actually turn his whole body so that his shoulders were square with their shoulders, his face square with their face, his eyes square with their eyes. And for as long as he spoke with them, he maintained that eye contact. He was entirely present in every task. One of the great Sufis, Hujviri, Data Genjbach in Lahore, he describes this ability to be wholeheartedly present as the defining feature of the lovers of God. And he gives this meaning to it. Have your heart be where your feet are. Have your heart be where your feet are. It's an antidote to the culture of scatteredness that abounds around us. People are competing for your attention. They want to monetize it. You can get on any of the apps that many of us have. And you scroll and you scroll and you scroll. And next thing you know, an hour has gone by. And what has happened to your one wild and precious life? You will never get to the bottom of Instagram, where Instagram will say, that's it, Omid. You read them all. You read all the posts. There's no more. That will never happen. It's an endless doom scrolling. Instead, what we are called to do is to cultivate the sense of being present, being attentive, and being whole. And we have a training for this. The training for this, oftentimes, in many of our spiritual traditions, is connected to disciplining and training the breath. The breath is the connection between the body and the spirit. By the breath, we do not simply mean air. It's not the simple process of breathing, though it's connected to it. It's the attentiveness, the consciousness that suffuses the breath. That's the reason why in our tradition, words like nafas, breath, and nafs, soul, are so closely related. Molana Rumi, at one point, says, wherever you are, be the soul of that place. Wherever you are, sanctify that place with your whole being. So your being can be like a light. But when you enter a space, 
people notice that something has shifted. If you are present to yourself, if you're present to Allah, then people receive the inspiration to be present to themselves and present with Allah. Uh, there's a majestic line of poetry from Mulana Rumi. Uh, the late Anne-Marie Schimmel says, this might be the single most autobiographical line that Rumi ever wrote. And in it, he says, I prayed so often that my whole being became a prayer. Everyone who sees me starts to pray. I prayed so often that my whole being became a prayer. Whenever someone sees me, they start to pray. Not that they start to pray to me, but that prayer is so real in him that other people want that too. They start mirroring that. They start reflecting that. That's the sign of someone who is wholeheartedly present. It's the reason why in our tradition, particularly in the eastern part of the Muslim world, we never mention the name of the prophets or the great saintly ones without adding this word Hazrat. Hazrat Ibrahim, Hazrat Nuh, Hazrat Musa, Hazrat Isa, Hazrat Muhammad, alayhi salatu wassalam. And that word Hazrat is both the sense of a person in whom you detect hudur, the presence of Allah, and someone who is present, wholly, completely present to their own being. And when you are present to your heart, that throne of the spirit, then the heart turns within and opens up towards all. As all of our sages have said, you are the grandness of the universe contained within. You are the alam sagir You are the microcosmos. You contain within you multitudes. And every teaching, every guidance, every light, every beauty, every virtue out there is also to be found within you. If we can find a way of having risen above dogma, risen above having a limited understanding of God, and indeed, we cannot even begin to pray until we say, Allahu Akbar, God is great. God is greater. God is the greatest. God is greater. Whatever idea, conception that I've had about God, I begin by acknowledging that God is greater than that. God is greater than my understanding of God. God is greater than the words that I use about God. God is greater than the thoughts I have had about God. If we limit God to the God of one people, the God of one species, a male God, an Arab God, a Jewish God, the God of humans, that's a small God. We deserve a more expansive God. The God of the Rabbul Alameen, the God of the infinite universes. So here's where you get to have teachings like that of Ibn Arabi. Um, you can start to see in this poem 
how and why it is that there is a there is an openness, there is a universality in this tradition. He talks about coming to this heart, this qalb, and the word qalb in Arabic has that sense of something that is dynamic, something that is perpetually shifting and in motion. It's never static. So the only way that you can really have a full embrace of the divine is if your capacity to be receptive towards God is itself always growing, always expanding. So this is what Ibn Arabi says. What wonder is this, a garden among the flames? My heart takes on every form. A pasture for gazelles, a cloister for monks, the idol's temple, a Kaaba for the circling pilgrim, the Torah's tables, and the Quran's pages. I follow the religion of love. Whichever way this caravan turns, I turn. This love is my religion, this my faith. And of course, uh, this intense and passionate love is connected to the chosen one, to the Habib. Because after all, the Habib, the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, is God's own beloved. If God is the God of the infinite universes, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, praise be to the cherishing, sustaining Lord of the infinite galaxies and universes, seen and unseen, then the Habib alayhi salatu wasalam is rahmatun lil alameen. He is that being sent as a mercy, not only to the Quraysh, not only to Arabs, not even just to Muslims or humanity, as many universes as there are, the Habib alayhi salatu wasalam has been sent as a mercy to all of them, seen and unseen. That's why he is the first born of creation. The nur of Muhammad, the light of Muhammad, is the very first thing that Allah created. It's for that reason that Ibn Arabi identifies him as Rasul Muhabbin, the chief of the lovers of God. If you claim to love Allah, he is our chief. And it is under his banner that we gather. Let's come back to this notion of this dynamic way of thinking about Allah, of being, in fact, with Allah. One of the great Sufis, Abu Nu'aym Isfahani, says at one point, um, my God, my Lord, in public, I call you Lord. But when we're alone together, I call you my beloved. In public, I call you Lord, but in private, I call you my beloved. It's this ability to shift registers, right? Um, ours is in some ways an age of public declaration of everything. The line between public and private is quite blurred. And there's a temptation to have everything be a hashtag something. <laughs> But not so much for our Sufi friends. There's also a notion of adab, of courtesy. Courtesy 
in recognizing that everyone is on their own journey and that somebody else is on a path that might be different than ours. So in public, you observe the decorum, the etiquette, the adab of the public, but in private, you call on God as the beloved. In fact, many of these Sufis speak about Allah as the deuced, the yar, the friend. Uh, every whirling dervish's performance, ceremony, ritual, this is the Molaviya, the Mevlavi order that traces itself back to Rumi. It begins with the line, Ya Hazrat Molana, O Hazrat Molana Rumi, Hakdost, the friend of God, the friend of God. God is your friend. As Rumi says, if God is your friend, whom do you have to fear? Is it not the case that for the chosen one, alayhi salatu wasalam, the very last phrase that he ever uttered as he was taking his dying breath was ar-rafiq al-a'la, the highest friend, the highest companion. What is death? other than the lifting of one last veil. Here we are with Allah. There we are with Allah. What room is there for fear or even hope for that matter? There's only being with Allah, being with the beloved. Another significant early Sufi, Shibli, says, the mystics are like children in the lap of God. The mystics are like children in the lap of God. So many teachings that um, one could share about these um, beautiful beings connected to the Habib, the chosen one, alayhi salatu wasalam, him connected to Allah. One of the important ways in which this relationship with Allah transforms our being is that the path leads to a kind of intimacy with God, where the vertical dimension, if you would, the Lord and servant dimension, never disappears, but it is supplemented, it is completed, perhaps, with this relationship of love, with this relationship of friendship, And so here's the saying from uh, one of the beautiful uh, early Sufis, an illiterate shepherd named Kharaqani. And this is how he experiences God. He says, God Almighty said to me, O my devotee, when you set out on the path, I am your path. When you come home, I am. I am your host. When you speak, I listen. When you think, I know your thoughts. When you flee to me, I take hold of you. When you are in awe of me, I comfort you. When you come to me in hope, I faithfully fulfill my promise. I am with you. You too be with me. When you thrive, 
I am with you. And when you are ruined and broken, I, I am with you. When you thrive, I am with you. And when you are ruined and broken, I am with you. So one thing that is really extraordinary is that if you love Allah, you have to love the ones whose breath contains something of Allah. If you love Allah, you love the handiwork of Allah, the creation of Allah. There is no duality between the love of Allah and the love of humanity, of nature. Everything sings, everything praises God. In fact, in the Sufi tradition, there's nothing that you could call an inanimate object. Even rocks and stones have a soul. Maulana Rumi had this beautiful tradition. Whenever he would pick up a glass to drink, before he would drink, he would kiss it, and then he would drink. And people would say, Maulana, why are you kissing the glass? And he would say, because it too has a john, has a soul, has a life force. He says, when you see rocks and plants, much less animals, to you they might appear to be things, but in the sight of Allah, they have a soul. So one of the beauties of this particular path is the way in which the love of Allah leads you to demonstrate that tenderness, that love, and indeed, that concern for justice towards all. The love of Allah leads to the transformation of the eyes. It changes how we look upon creation. The transformation of the ears, what we hear. The transformation of the tongue, how we speak the transformation of the hands, the work that we do and how we touch one another, the transformation of the belly, of the sexual organs, of the feet, of all of us. There's a wonderful story um, that Mulana Rumi and other sages like Saadi share. Um, the story is told of a great khalifa, a great caliph, who has been listening to the great poet Majnun's famous love songs in praise of his beloved Layla. And Layla, as you might know, is the dark beloved, that beloved who is dark like the night, Layla and Layla, dark eyes, dark eyebrows, dark hair, perhaps even a dark skin. And um, Majnun is the love-crazed one. He's even forgotten his own name. He's only Layla's Majnun. And the Khalifa reads of these poems. He hears about them. And he's like, I've got to meet this girl. <laughs> Any girl who would inspire such exquisite love songs has to be a girl of unsurpassing beauty. So he summons up Layla to his court, and just because he's the Khalifa and he can do that, to cover all the bases, in case there's one even more beautiful than her, he summons all the women from Layla's village to his court. So all day he's been tingling in excitement, getting to meet this Layla. And he walks into the court and sits down and he looks at the gathering of women before him and his eyes start scanning the room because he's sure that one of them is just going to surface above the other ones. 
But to his surprise, they all look pretty ordinary. No one of them seems to be more stunning than the next. So he turns to his vizier, to his advisor. Did you bring Layla? Yes, your majesty, we brought Layla. She's here. Yes, she is here. And so finally, he's so puzzled, he turns to the crowd of women and he goes, is one of you all Layla? And uh, you better watch out, because in this tradition, the women speak back. So Layla steps forth from the crowd. She looks pretty simple, very plain, not distinguishable from any of the other ones. And the Khalifa is puzzled and he goes, you? You are Layla? He's looking up at the poems that he's been reading. You are the Layla that inspired that poem? All those poems? And Layla says, I am Layla. But you, you are not Majnun. You are not Majnun. And the poets go on to add, in order to see the beauty of Layla, you have to look through the eyes of Majnun. We need to have eyes that are transformed. We have to learn to see the beauty in each other and the beauty in ourselves, the beauty in nature, the beauty in all. We are the handiwork of a beautiful God. What did Rabia says? Do not withhold from me your everlasting beauty. Jamal Baqi. In the ancient and eternal covenant, when Allah had gathered up the whole of humanity and God has us testifying, bearing witness. Alastu barabbikum, am I not your cherishing, sustaining Lord? Bal shahidna, yes, we bear witness. And that bearing witness is related to the word shahid, the beautiful one, the beautiful witness that to see God's beauty is to testify to God. God is the source of all beauty. Inna Allah jameel wa yuhibbul jamal. God is lovely and God loves loveliness. God is beautiful and God loves beauty. So we need beautiful eyes to see beauty in one another. Not just physical beauty the beauty of the heart, inside, outside. And that love, according to so many of our sages like Molana Rumi, is like water. Water always flows down to the low ground. So Rumi says, real love, true love, flows down towards those who find themselves humbled, broken. And there's a hadith of the chosen one, alayhi salatu wasalam, that you find in the teachings of sages like Ibn Arabi, where God asks humanity in the day to come, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. People say, Ya Allah, you are the Lord of the infinite universes. How could you be hungry? If you had gone to the hungry, you would have found me with them. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me drink. Ya Allah, how could you be thirsty? If you had gone to the thirsty, you would have found me with them. If you had gone to the homeless, to the occupied, to the downtrodden, those out on the margins, those hurting and broken, 
you would have found me with them. So God's love permeates all, but is particularly attentive to the broken ones, to the ones hurting. And in this path, we are invited to bring our pain, to bring our hurt, and offer it to Allah. That's the one thing that perhaps you could say is missing from God's gathering. Brokenness, pain, hurt. So bring it to Allah. Offer the one thing that we might have to offer. And Allah receives, as the Sufis say, Allah will buy your nothingness and offer you everything. Oh. Uh, let me end this reflection, this reminder that as Mulana Rumi says, we all have our wounds and the wound is where the light enters you. The wound is where the light enters you. Uh, with one of my favorite stories, this one is also from that dear and beloved illiterate shepherd, Kharaghani. He tells the story, a charming story of um, two brothers. Both brothers from the same mother, raised in the same house, but their temperaments are quite different. Uh, one of them, in the story, he's called the praying brother. He spends morning, noon, and night not only doing the required prayers, but all of the extra prayers. The other brother does perhaps the minimum required prayers, but instead he comes to devote his life to taking care of their elderly and weak mother. In the daytime, Mama, can I take care of you? Mama, can I run an errand for you? Mama, can I walk you to the bathroom? And at nighttime, he keeps a vigil by her bedside. Mama, can I get you a drink? Mama, can I wa wipe your forehead? And then one day, the praying brother finally has a visionary experience of Allah in which he hears the voice of Allah saying to him, congratulations, for the sake of your brother, I have decided to forgive both of you and admit both of you to my highest paradise. And the praying brother says, oh, ya Allah, I have been hoping for this day all of my life. Um, but clearly, Ya Allah, you are mistaken because I think what you meant to say was, for my sake, because you see, I am the praying brother, for the sake of all of my prayers and my devotion, you have chosen to forgive my brother. And the voice of Allah comes firmly but gently. Uh, I'm pretty clear whom I am speaking with, because you see, all of those extra prayers that you did for me, I have no need of. But your mama needs you. And that's the end of the story. Your mama needs you. Do your prayers. Do the minimum prayers that are required. And then if there's a choice between extra and extra and extra prayers or taking care of your mother, taking care of the weak, the elderly, the broken, the hurting, go to that. Be like the water that flows down because that's pure mercy, pure compassion, pure love. God doesn't need your extra prayers, but
but the hurting and the wounded in our community do. So I'm going to pause here. And before I let you go, I'm going to share just a few resources. Oftentimes after these talks, uh, friends come to me and say, oh, you know, I benefited so much. Where can I um, learn more? I haven't heard so much about this tradition of love and mercy in our tradition. So here's a few suggestions. Almost all the teachings and the anecdotes that I shared with you, um, they're translated in my book, Radical Love, Teachings from the Islamic Mystical Tradition. Uh, you can order it from your favorite uh, bookstore or online. I've translated them freshly from Arabic and Persian uh, original sources. There are podcast opportunities. So there's a podcast I have called Sufi Heart. It's at the Be Here Now Network. And we've got maybe 26 or 7 episodes up and more being loaded up. Uh, at the Sufi Heart podcast. Almost all of them are devoted to the Sufi tradition. We also have online courses. So if you go to our website, www.illuminatedcourses.com, uh, we have a number of pre-recorded video-based courses Heart of the Quran is perhaps our most popular one. Uh, it's a 14-hour <laughs> course that you can move through at your own time and pace, getting a sense of the ways in which the teachings of the Habib, alayhi salatu wasalam, of the family of the Prophet, of the companions, and of extraordinary Sufis and friends of God like Rumi and Ibn Arabi, has opened up this inner world of the Quran. We have a separate course, The Heart of Rumi's Poetry, a seven-hour course that takes you step by step by step through Rumi's masterpiece, the Masnavi. You don't um, need to know any Arabic or Persian. For them, all the offerings are in English. And then we have monthly gatherings online called Chai, Love, and Prayers. And these are held on a Saturday, usually at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And if you go again to our website, you can see when the next ones are coming up, as well as being able to access the previous ones. And every month we have a short spiritual talk an opportunity to meet like-minded and like-hearted friends from around the world and uh, to engage in a mystical practice or reflection to carry you for the next month. And for those who are interested and able for the last 20 some odd years, we have offered retreat programs around the world. Our first program, and still our largest program, is in Turkey. We go every year, usually in May or June, um, in Istanbul, and also other regions, uh, including Konya, where Molana Rumi, of course, resides. These are open to friends of every country, nationality and background. Um, they're almost always Muslim majority, but not exclusive and female majority. I think that's important, and it adds a different dimension and flavor to our gatherings. Uh, for the last six years, we've had programs in Morocco, based in Marrakesh and Fez, and sometimes the desert. And starting in 2022, we have added an Umrah program in Mecca and Medina for those who don't want to just perform the necessary rites and rituals of uh, going on pilgrimage, but also want to go to the heart of those rituals. So we've always wanted to 
walk around the Kaaba and have a sense of the Kaaba as the external symbol of the heart. This could be a program for you. Uh, here's a photo of some of our participants gathered around the Kaaba, many of these luminous women from many different nationalities and backgrounds. And then, of course, we go to Medina, uh, that gentle, beautiful garden uh, where the whole city bears the trait and the quality of the chosen one. And uh, we're able to have, mashallah, an exquisite a private residence, which we use for our teachings and opportunities for dhikr, fellowship, and friendship. And it's a place where that ihsan dimension, to go back to where we started from, that element of beauty uh, is very much present in our gathering. So inshallah, something in these uh, offerings can be an asset for you, can keep you company, can um, be a light on your path. And uh, as Mulana Rumi says, be a beacon for you to return back to the root of the root of your being. Uh, thank you so much for the gift of your company. Thank you for your attentiveness and time and presence. May God bless you, illuminate you, and make your lives whole. <laughs> Süleyman, kuş değilim